Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Roland Barthes' essay, The World of Wrestling, which is found in his text, uh, Mythology. So, mythology. Uh, so yeah, we'll talk about that today. Uh, hi, I'm David. I like to, to explain, I can't speak today. I like to explain philosophical ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So uh, if you're new here, you can go check out my channel and you'll see like 250 videos. You can subscribe and you'll see videos I release every single week, sometimes twice a week. Uh, if you want to help me out, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, who knows they might get a kick out of it. If you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts. Or if you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find it on YouTube with a video if you're into that at all. Um, yeah, if you want to help me out monetarily, you can do that via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. And uh, links for that in the description if you're interested. And yeah. Let's talk about Roland Barthes' The World of Wrestling. So this opens the book Mythology, which is kind of his mythologies, which is his probably his most like pronounced important text. Um, and this text is essentially a way for him to understand the way that ideas become naturalized in the world, how they become almost like cultural myths and how these myths become natural and therefore unquestionable. And his book here is an effort to understand and to reveal the extent to which these myths aren't natural, how they are culturally coded and determined and established. Now, in this essay, The World of Wrestling, what he is doing is looking at wrestling as almost a demonstration of such myths, including myths pertaining to justice, to good and evil, and, and so on. Now, wrestling, he says, has a long history like as a sport certainly it goes all the way back to ancient Greece but the wrestling he's talking about here is that spectacular form that is kind of like presents a narrative and this also for him has its roots in ancient Greek theater it was all about or it's all about uh, enacting a kind of play for an audience now of course the venue is different it's not done in open air uh, theater or something like that it's done in uh, probably a building dark building where uh, the actors are essentially acting out in a, in a different space, but they both resemble one another in that they are demonstrating and performing a kind of play. So it's important to note then it, it's not a sport, it's, it's more of a spectacle because no one thinks that there's actually like a competition going on with wrestling in this way. And again, we're talking about the spectacular form of wrestling, not like the actual competition. And nobody thinks that it is, right? No one goes thinking that there's like an actual competition being had here. It's, it's scripted in advance. So in contrast to something like real wrestling or like boxing or judo, in wrestling as a spectacular form, what we see is not ever like conclusive moments that are to be almost avoided. So in boxing or in wrestling that is competitive, people try to avoid defeat. Whereas in the case of this kind of wrestling, Defeat is something that enters and becomes part of the spectacle and people uh, gyrate, they, people uh, contort their faces and, and exaggerate their expressions to lend a sense to what defeat means in any instance and what victory means in any instance. And it all plays towards the entire spectacle. There isn't like that end point that will determine things and it will be done it sort of always implies a, a, a futurity to it. And uh, for those that are familiar with wrestling, these narratives extend far beyond any single match to uh, ones to come as well. And the outcome of any given match can sometimes even be determined in advance. And this comes out in the ways that the actors are presented. They appeal to certain codes that people understand and associate with goodness. They associate with evil, like, people uh, dressing in certain colors that people, the audience will associate with being bad, people having certain attributes that people associate with being bad. And so Balth is thinking about this wrestling as almost like a window to look through to understand the culture in which it is embedded. What are these codes that are set up, that are used to elicit a sense of uh, anger at a certain character at a certain actor what codes are used to convey that someone is good 
versus evil and how we can unpack these codes and better understand ourselves. So what the people want when they're watching wrestling is not this competition. They want intelligibility. What I mean by that is they want to see things that make sense to them, which only means that they are watching things that make sense to them culturally as they understand certain signs to refer to certain things, certain signs referring to evil, to good, to justice, and so on. And at the core of all of this in wrestling is often a demonstration of justice or a lack of justice and how that feeds into the entire enterprise. Now he notes that there's a difference here between uh, the wrestling he's talking about, and he wrote this in the late 50s, the wrestling he's talking about in France and that of America, where he says that in America people were associating with uh, certain characters or they were watching wrestling as a match between good and evil, whereas he says that in France people would associate with, uh, you know, the just figures who stood in for and uh, defended justice while admonishing those who broke the rules, who did not comply to what was just to the law. So in, in France, and this is very much true of in, in America as well, um, certainly today, people hate those characters that break the rules, who jump out of the ring when they aren't supposed to, who uh, sucker punch their opponent behind the ref's back. And all of this, even though it's all stage, contributes to the audience's animosity toward or ire toward those certain people who break the law, break the rules when it is uh, convenient for them, and they follow them when it's convenient for them. And this generates a very effective, very real embodied response by the audience, which attests to the fact that there is a strong attachment between the people watching and their conception of what is right and wrong, what is just. And by seeing that be played with on stage demonstrates a kind of mastery on the part of the the actors, of the writers of these productions, to play with that cultural understanding of justice, to be able to exploit it and to reveal the extent to which we are very much attached to it and com committed to it and want to defend it, and how using that in order to present certain actors, certain characters as being evil is really quite genius, and it says a lot about ourselves. And in wrestling, where everything is just so black and white. You know who's good, you know who's evil, you know who's following justice, you know who's not following justice. It puts forward in Bout's words an ideal image of things or an ideal understanding of things, which is to say that it complies to our most basic understanding of law of justice, of good and evil, which makes it so easy to digest and therefore makes it such a rich avenue for people to study in order to engage with, engage with the people that are watching it and the cultural situation they find themselves in. And it speaks to a kind of natural law. And what I mean by that is that if there was a natural law, hypothetically, that provided the foundation for something called justice, that natural law would be decidedly simple. It would be something that was black and white. There's, there's just simply right and wrong. Now, in society, things get muddied up a little bit. You know, partiality comes into, uh, into the frame perspective comes into the frame and that messes things up. So we have a desire to try to make things simple. And this is really put on display in wrestling that almost like appeals to uh, some kind of natural law, even though that, of course, that natural law doesn't exist. By putting it out on stage and by having an audience completely comply with it and to understand when rules are broken without anyone coming out and saying, look, X, Y, and Z rules were broken, so you should be mad about this. People just have an immediate sense, kind of perception of it. That, it, that reveals the extent to which we have naturalized these very uh, laws. We have naturalized these, this conception of justice, which works then to not only provide good entertainment, but to affirm our understanding of what justice is to naturalize it and have it enter into the world as, or for it to enter the world as myth and then become natural as though it cannot be questioned. And yeah, that more or less covers this kind of short uh, essay. I'll probably do scattering uh, presentations of the different essays in this book because it's hard to do it all at once. You know, each 
chapters or each essay is so different that it wouldn't make sense so it'll make for shorter ones and uh yeah if there's anything i excluded i'd love to hear about it uh or anything i got wrong i'd love to hear about it if you like what i did like share subscribe tell your friends and yeah catch you next time take care